Hey, everybody. We got all these people out here. We got all these people in the audience. I want to thank everybody for being here. Firstly, I want to say a very warm thank you and good evening to all of you here in Atlanta. What are you going to say? <laughs> See, there's really live people here. That's pretty amazing. So we, I, MSU the News, my name is Stuart Schlossman. We're here, I'm a very far away from people, I'm taking off my mask for a moment. Everybody in our room is supposed to be wearing a mask until it is time to eat, all right? And um, that's the way we're gonna have to do it here. All right, so tonight's program is a hybrid program. What does it mean by being hybrid? Uh, prior to the pandemic, really nobody knew that, except that it, maybe it was a car, all right? And now we got it as happening with programs, not just in the MS community, but in other, in other disease states that are starting to do programs as well. So what we're doing is we're doing a in-person program, and we do have quite a few people here tonight. We're doing an in-person program, and we're also live streaming, which just makes it virtual, which makes it a hybrid program. All right, so we have, for the virtual program, for the virtual program, we have EMD Serono, Novartis, Biogen, Sanofi, Genzyme, Genentech, and Bristol-Myers Squibb. And I wanna thank them, and I hope everybody at home and here can give them a round of applause and say thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Then tonight, outside, for the first time since the pandemic began, we have exhibitors. And outside tonight, we have Sanofi Genzyme and we have Genentech, all right? And they are, like I said, our first live exhibitors for a program since this pandemic began, and I am thanking them for being here as well. We have a person who, obviously, you all know from the Atlanta area, all right? And I've known Dr. Thrower since way before we did our first educational program in Atlanta, Georgia. And that was about eight or nine, maybe 10 years ago already, where we came up here and we just filled, filled the, uh, it was like an outdoor arena type thing under a big bubble. And Dr. Thrower and Tracy Walker came to the speak at that program. It was up at a hotel property near Sandy Springs, I believe, somewhere up in the, uh, the perimeter. And, um, and it was just so joyous for me to have so many people from the Atlanta area to be able to come and be at that program. So again, to introduce you all to Dr. Ben Thrower. Dr. Ben Thrower is the guru, like I said earlier, of multiple sclerosis in the Atlanta, Georgia area, and probably in most of the South. And Dr. Thrower is with the Andrew C. Carlos Multiple Sclerosis Institute at the Shepherd Center. And I doubt he's gonna come running up on the stage, all right, but he is trying to make his way around the room real quick because he did not want to go in front of the cameras. So he is coming in, you gotta come running up now, you started it, come on. You gotta show everybody how you keep up with all the animals. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Thrower will be speaking with you about a lot of different things, all right? He's got the topics. He's got a great slideshow. Let's get started. And after his presentation, which will be about 45 minutes long, I will be going around the room to get your questions. Thank you. Perfect. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to uh, Stuart for, for putting all this together. Thank you for the sponsors being here. We really appreciate you. We've lived through some weird times in the past year and a half. It's wonderful to see people back in, in person and not just do the, the um, uh, virtual things. So when Stuart uh, asked me to speak tonight, I said, well, what should we talk about? And Stuart said, everything. So this is the everything talk, or a little bit of everything at least. So I picked out four everythings to talk about tonight. We're going to do just a brief overview of multiple sclerosis. I am speaking to a room full of professionals. Uh, many of you in this room have been dealing with MS for a while. Some, we may have some newcomers, though, to MS. And so I wanted to just give an overview of what we think MS is, what some of the causes are, uh, talk a little bit about some of the, the, how we select MS therapies. And in this kind of era of COVID, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, COVID specifically as it relates to vaccinations, and then we'll finish up with what's on the horizon. And this, there we go. So MS is incredibly complicated. We learn new things every year about the immunology of multiple sclerosis. This is a vast oversimplification of what MS does. MS involves your T cells, your B cells, dendritic cells, so many different cells in the immune system. 
And we learn more and more. I've heard people compare MS to a never ending onion. You peel back layer upon layer. And every time we learn something, we learn two things that we didn't know. That's both intimidating and in some ways encouraging. Every time we find a new complexity, that represents a new therapeutic target for things that we can go after with multiple sclerosis. So this is a schematic of what, your, the, what the axons in your central nervous system should look like. So you have the orange wire or the axon. You have the blue, the, the coating, the myelin on the outside. Myelin is 95% fat. It's a really good insulator. And what happens is electrical information jumps from gap to gap to gap in that myelin, in that, that insulation. It's called saltatory conduction. It's a really fast, really efficient way to get electrical information up and down the central nervous system. Moving forward. So now comes MS. So all of that complex immunology that we showed earlier is going to lead to an attack on the myelin. So you're chewing up this insulation so you no longer get that really fast, really efficient way of getting electrical information up and down. If we were having this discussion prior to 1998, our discussion would have stopped right there because we thought of MS as just a demyelinating condition. But in 1998, Bruce Trapp at the Cleveland Clinic showed Notice what's on the next slide. That MS actually de de degrades the nerve fiber itself, axonal transection. So when you cut the wire, there is no more electrical information going up and down that nerve fiber. And we, we, what Dr. Trapp showed is that this sort of axonal transection occurs very early in the course of multiple sclerosis. Right after this statement came out, this research came out, the National MS Society put together its first bulletin or statement on treating MS early, getting the diagnosis made early, getting people on treatment early. And I would argue that as more and more therapies have come on board, we've become more and more aggressive in how we diagnose and get people on treatment. Moving forward. So MS, MS is a very common disorder in the temperate and developed world. So when we say the temperate world, we mean as you get away from the equator. So multiple sclerosis gets more common as we go away from the equator. So if you look at our prevalence, say in, in Georgia, we have about 70 per 100,000 people with multiple sclerosis in the state of Georgia. If you go up to Minnesota, upstate New York, you're more like 250 per 100,000 people with multiple sclerosis. The demographics of who gets MS looks like it's shifting a little bit. If you were to have read a textbook in the 1950s, 60s, they would have said MS is a pre uh, predominantly a health condition of Caucasians. And we know now that we see plenty of African Americans with multiple sclerosis. At Shepherd Center, 45 to 50 percent of the people that we work with are African American. There was a study a few years ago at one of the California MS centers, and for the first time ever, the majority of their newly diagnosed individuals with MS were African American. We're not quite sure what to make of that you know what's changing that would drive that we don't think genetically we're changing you know as a human race that quickly so there is a suspicion could it be something environmental that's leading to this change in in who's getting multiple sclerosis um, still if you look at the highest prevalence of multiple sclerosis in the world the the prize the dubious prize winner remains the Orkney Islands off of Scotland they have a prevalence of about 300 per hundred thousand people there are parts of the world where you just don't see MS where it would be almost unheard of. The continent of Africa itself, very, very unlikely to see multiple sclerosis on the continent of Africa, except when you get to the extreme northern part and the extreme southern part of Africa. Northern part of Africa, you're starting to get more European influences. South Africa, you have the Dutch population, and we think that that may be the explanation for why we see MS there, but not really in the middle part. True Native Americans, unheard of to see multiple sclerosis in true Native Americans. So these are areas of a lot of research. You know, what is it immunologically and genetically that, that sort of protects some of these groups from getting an autoimmune condition like MS? Moving forward. So MS results from this complex sort of interplay between your genetics, your environment, and maybe infectious things. So MS has a genetic uh, component, but it's a weakly hereditary disease. So if you have MS, 
your first degree relatives, your brothers, your sisters, your children, have about a 25 to 3% chance of having MS in their lifetime. That's higher than the general public, but is still a lower risk. So there's a genetic component, but not, not strongly hereditary. We know of over 200 genes now that actually come into play and put a person at risk for MS. You could have every single one of those genes and not have multiple sclerosis. Something has to turn those genes on. And we think what turns those genes on is the environment and infections. Infections would be things like common viral exposures, Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus 6, which is roseola in children. These are viruses that on their surface look enough like myelin basic protein that they can fool your immune system if you're genetically susceptible to going down this autoimmune pathway of multiple sclerosis. Um, and then finally, the, the environment, things like vitamin D levels early in life, cigarette smoking, salt intake, all of these things are environmental components that may sort of combine with your genetics and those infectious disease exposures to sort of lead you to have MS. We think that the table is set for a person to have multiple sclerosis by the time they're 15 to 16 years of age. You may not have symptoms until you're 20, 30, 40, or older, but everything was there for you to have MS by the time you were a teenager. Moving forward. So these are, again, some of those environmental components. We're big on checking vitamin D levels. We know that about 85% of people with MS are vitamin D deficient, and there is good data out there suggesting that if we correct your vitamin D deficiency, we offer you some level of protection against your MS acting up. Um, obesity, uh, cholesterol levels, cigarette smoking, salt intake, tobacco use, all of these things are little risk factors by themselves probably wouldn't cause MS, but again, if you have the right genes and the right infection exposures early, they may be part of that puzzle. Moving forward. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit. So that's kind of some of the, 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 the foundations so that we're all in the same playing field. I picked one symptom to really focus on tonight, and I think it ties in nicely with what Jeff was doing, and that symptom is spasticity. So spasticity is a, ter is a word that comes from an ancient Greek term, spastikos, which means to pull or to tug. The fancy medical definition of spasticity is it's a velocity-dependent increase in uh, resistance to passive resistance. And so basically, if you have spasticity, if I were to slowly move your arm outwards, maybe I feel a little bit of tightness. If I were to suddenly pull your arm down quickly, that muscle's gonna grab and tighten up and you're gonna want to flex in the opposite direction. Um, it's a hyper excitability of the deep tendon reflex. So when we talk about deep tendon reflexes, when we tap on your knees with a reflex hammer when you come into the exam room, that's a deep tendon reflex. People with spasticity tend to have really hyperactive deep tendon reflexes. We call them get back reflexes when we tap on the knee because you, you need to get back. Next. So we kind of distinguish between spasticity and sp uh, spasms. Spasticity would be the sort of the chronic state of increased muscle tone, the muscles being tight all the time. Uh, and then the spasm is kind of that wave, of uh, that tonic wave. That, that wave of, of increased muscle tone can be quite painful uh, in some people. Next. So what does spasticity look like? What are the signs of it? So I, I, I presented here this little sort of cartoon uh, gentleman. This is, would be someone with, with rather extreme spasticity affecting both his arm and his leg. Spasticity in the legs tends to be extensor. Your leg wants to stiffen out. So you can see he's kind of got his leg in a stiffened position. Spasticity in the arm tends to be flexor. You can see he's carrying his arm in a flexed position. So think of someone that has maybe had a stroke, and you see that, that flexed arm position, extended leg, and it really affects the walking. So you can see when he's trying to walk here, the, the footprint in black is the normal extremity. It's sort of in a straight line. It's going uh, in the, the uh, direction of his walking, whereas his affected leg in red, he's having to swing that out and around because he really can't flex at the hip or the knee. So he's having to, to sort of kick that leg out to, uh, to uh, 
uh, move. We talk about spasticity as if it's always a bad thing. And it's strange to think of spasticity as being anything but bad, but spasticity can be functional also. One of the reasons we really like to get physical therapists involved in the management of spasticity is to help us sort out, is some of your spasticity actually helping you function? How could that be? Well, if your leg wants to stiffen out, or maybe both legs want to stiffen out, let's say you're going to, to transfer from, uh, from chair to, uh, to uh, trying to stand, or you're trying to get from your uh, chair, uh, you know, standing up and now into your car. Well, if you, if you have weakness in your legs, when we stand you up, your legs may want to stiffen out. You may actually use that extensor tone to help with transfers and with walking. That same spasticity they may, may help you stand up to get from your chair to your car. Now when you sit down in the car seat can then become a bad thing. So some of you may have experienced this. You get in the car seat and now your legs won't bend at all. They're just as straight as a board. You can't get your, your hips, your knees to bend to fold them up to get into the car. So we like to get the physical therapist to help us out in determining how much spasticity is actually a good thing for you. So many of you may have experienced something called the MS hug. You know, I remember when I was in training, I heard MS hug. I thought, oh, isn't that nice? People are getting a hug. That sounds like a, a wonderful thing. This is a hug you don't want to have, kind of like being hugged by a grizzly bear. Uh, it's tight sensation, can be around the chest or the abdomen, um, ranges from mildly uncomfortable to not being able to, to breathe very well. So this just represents tightness in the, the um, muscles between the rib cage. People that have the MS hug will sometimes say that it affects their breathing. We try to reassure folks that you're, if we measure your oxygenation when you have this sensation, your oxygenation is going to be normal. It is a sensation of not being able to take a full breath because what's happening is your rib cage can't fully expand. Most of air movement in the lungs is actually from the diaphragms, not from the ribs. So even though you get this kind of belt band-like sensation across your chest and it feels like you can't take a deep breath, it's not actually affecting your oxygenation. So we try to reassure people. It's not to say we want you to have to put up with it, but it, it, it may not be as much of a physiologic uh, problem as, as sometimes uh, people might think it is. Next. So how do we manage spasticity? We think of a uh, kind of a pyramid or a ladder type approach. Uh, the first thing we want to do when we're managing your spasms and spasticity is remove noxious stimuli. What does that mean? Anything that takes you out of, off your game, you're too hot, you're too cold, you have an upper respiratory infection, you have a UTI, you're stressed, you're sleep deprived, you have a shoe that doesn't fit, you have an ankle foot orthotic that doesn't fit, you have skin breakdown on an ankle. All of those things are noxious stimuli. They bother your body and they will make spasms and spasticity worse. If we hear someone say, you know, my level of functioning is here and I woke up one day and suddenly my spasticity and my spasms are just going nuts. One of the first things that we think about is urinary tract infection, urinary tract infection, urinary tract infection. A lot of times that underlying UTI is maybe driving that. For many people with MS, their symptom of a UTI is not going to be urological, it's going to be neurological, and spasticity may be one of the common ways that that UTI is going to act up. So if we've addressed that, that kind of next not notch up is the rehabilitation. So Jeff talked some about the importance of stretching, uh, getting you in with a physical therapist, just making sure that we're keeping you as limber as you can be. Then we start talking about medications, and then I'll, I'll finish out just with a brief uh, mention on intrathecal baclofen. So these, and not to, to I don't want to tread into Jeff's uh, territory. Uh, if I could get folks that I work with just to do two stretches on their legs twice a day, I'd be happy. More is better. You can't stretch too much. So if you could do something that looks, <clears throat> excuse me, like the, the runner's stretch on the bottom to hit your quads, I think this is easiest to do when you're lying down. Just grabbing the bottom of your foot, pulling your heel back towards your butt will kind of stretch out some of those muscles in the, the above the knee. When you stretch, you want to be slow and easy. No herky-jerky movement. Months, stretch to the point where it feels just mildly uncomfortable and hold it there for a couple of minutes. If you can, flip over and do the other leg. I think the best way to stretch out your calf muscles, the, the, the muscles below the knee, is to just get a towel, sit down or lie down, put that towel into the bottom of your foot, 
pull back slowly and gently till it's mildly uncomfortable, maybe back off a hair, hold it there for a couple of minutes. And if I could get folks to do that morning and night, I think it goes a long ways towards diminishing some of the spasms and spasticity that we see. So medications, we've got a bunch of things in the toolbox. Uh, I would say the two most commonly used uh, oral medications for spasticity and spasms in MS are going to be baclofen and tizanidine. They've both been around forever. They work differently. It's not that one's better than the other. It's just that they're different. The key with either of these is to start with a low dose and kind of ease your way into it. Typically, what we'll do with these medicines is we'll go, go slowly up on the dose until one of two things happens. Either you're sleepy or you're happy with the degree of spasticity control. Usually, sedation is going to be the rate limiting factor. When you start getting just too drowsy with it, that's probably as hard as we can go with, with that dose. The other thing we have to be aware of with, with baclofen is as we go up on the dose and we make your muscles looser, sometimes we make people a little noodly also, and we, make, we may trade uh, control their spasms and spasticity for a little bit of weakness. We don't want to do that either. Dantrolene, old medication for spasms. Um, can't really explain why it doesn't work uh, as well in MS as it would, say, in spinal cord injury. We try it sometimes. I'm not blown away with what it does. Um, Keppra, seizure medicine that sometimes will help with spasms with the waves of spasticity. And then we'll talk a little bit about cannabinoids. So this would be your, your medical marijuana or things in that class. Dronabinol or Marinol is an FDA-approved synthetic THC. It is FDA approved for nausea and chemotherapy patients or for extreme weight loss in certain patients. It's, it can be an appetite stimulant or can, can be used for nausea. Can also be used to treat spasms and spasticity. Uh, Sativex, we'll mention uh, in just a moment. And then other, other forms of cannabis. So whether it's, you know, like in Georgia, we could talk about the CBD THC registry that we have here. And people are allowed to have a 5% THC oil that we could potentially use for treating spasticity and spasticity. Next slide. So when we think about the, what, what does the science say on um, medical marijuana or cannabinoids for managing MS symptoms, there are really three symptoms that, that primarily are, could be targeted with cannabinoids in MS. Spasticity and spasms would be the most, uh, most uh, commonly used uh, reason. But we also use it for central neuropathic pain, just burning and hypersensitivity. And there's also some data out there for using it for urinary frequency and urgency. It's tempting to think that cannabinoids might be used to actually change the course of MS, just like we would use a disease-modifying therapy. Everything in the literature says that cannabinoids are anti-inflammatory. No one's been able to prove it yet. We haven't been able to show in a, in a, a double-blind trial that we can actually decrease relapse rates, change progression of disability, or prevent new MRI lesions, but, it's, but people are trying. So there are quite a number of trials. Probably the best data is with uh, Sativex or Nabixamols. Sativex is in, we're doing a phase three study at Shepherd. We're probably going to start a second one here soon. This is a, a one-to-one -one CBD THC sublingual spray. Uh, it's been FDA appro approved by regulatory bodies in, in multiple other countries for years. We know this stuff works. Um, there are several trials that have shown that it reduces spasms and spasticity anywhere between 42 and 83 percent between the trial that you're, you're looking at. And this is the, the uh, Sativex itself. It's made by GW Pharmaceuticals in the UK. They've partnered with a company here in the US called Greenwich Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we are right in the middle of a phase three trial. They, what this company does is they grow a hemp plant that's very high in CBD. They isolate that CBD. They grow a traditional sat sativa, a cannabis plant that's very high in THC. They isolate the THC, and then they combine those into a one-to-one -one, uh, oil between the, the, uh, the two different plants. Um, Finally, intrathecal baclofen, this would be one of the more aggressive things that we can do uh, for spasticity and spasms. So this uh, pump is about the size of a hockey puck. It's surgically implanted on your side. Surgical tubing is going to deliver concentrated uh, liquid baclofen into the spinal fluid. Um, can be a, a great way to manage spasticity. Obviously, it's a big deal to have something surgically implanted into your body. These pumps are good for about five years, and then they have to be changed out. They have to be refilled through a uh, subcutaneous injection to access that port. They're refilled about every three months. 
before someone has one of these put in, you want to make sure that it's going to do what you want it to do. So there's a baclofen pump, pump trial that people go through before they have one of these implanted. Shifting over now to uh, MS and, and COVID, we're going to talk a little bit about how the COVID pandemic has changed the way we practice medicine, uh, not just in neurology, but across multiple uh, specialties. We'll talk a little bit uh, about immune suppression, disease-modifying therapies, and then finally vaccinations. Uh, so telehealth. How many of you have done a telehealth visit during the pandemic? So quite a, f quite a few people. So telehealth was something that it felt like the American medicine was right on the cusp of. We were ab about to embrace it. Uh, everyone was just going, yeah, it's a cool idea. We'll, we'll get into it here soon. And then the pandemic came along and we all got into it whether we wanted to or not. Um, there have been some great things with telehealth. I think for people who have mobility issues, people who live a long ways from their, their doctor, um, the transportation challenges, the telehealth has been a wonderful thing. It has let us sometimes get eyes on what someone's living environment is like and say, well, here's where some of the challenges are. We've discovered that a lot of you folks are hoarders out there. And so we're seeing all kinds of stuff. And it's like, no wonder you're tripping all the time. There's stuff all over the floor there. So sometimes fixing the, the fall issue is, is, is more than just physical therapy. Um, I think it lends itself more to certain types of visits than others. Obviously, if we need to do safety laboratory monitoring, if you've got an MRI visit, if you have an infusion, that's not really a great telehealth visit. If we're just following up after we started a medication, that's a perfect telehealth visit. I think counseling lends itself really well to telehealth. Uh, speech therapy may be a good telehealth option. Some forms of exercise, as Jeff was mentioning, you know, we've got, <coughs> excuse me, got you know forms of exercise that can be done online um, so I think that that it, it's opening up new worlds we are right in the middle of a study at Shepherd Center through a group called PCORI patient patient centered outcomes research initiative what PCORI does at the federal level is it looks at different health uh, conditions could be diabetes, hypertension, Parkinson's, MS, and rather than the healthcare community dictating what the research is going to look like, you dictate what the research is going to look like. And one of the areas that the MS community uh, told PCORI they would like to see are maybe some tele-rehab options. What if you could work with a physical therapist and then maybe an uh, exercise physiologist remotely? So what we've done with the PCORI grant, along with some other MS centers, is we took one group of individuals and they went, they came into Shepherd. They're doing physical therapy, occupational therapy through the usual in-person route, and another group is doing it through telehealth. And we're going to see what how, what the outcomes look like over time, what the adherence to the program is is going to look like over time. So uh, MS in the immune system. I think when we talk about the COVID pandemic and how you know, sort of COVID relates to the MS world, one of the things that's important to step back with and realize, and it's, it's still a misconception that many people with MS have, is that MS by itself, if we put the therapies aside, MS by itself does not suppress your immune system. You do not have an underactive immune system. You have a relatively overactive immune system. So MS by itself really shouldn't put people at higher risk for things like a COVID or other respiratory infection. Now, when we come along with our therapies, we may change that dynamic. And that's been a very important concept here to think about how different therapies work and how it's going to you know, affect vaccinations or COVID risk. So when we think about the MS therapies themselves, there's been a shift in the past few years towards being very aggressive in getting people on the most effective therapy we can as quickly as we can. And so we used to do a lot of what we call escalation therapy. We would pick a therapy with a great safety profile, but maybe modest uh, effectiveness. And if that didn't work, then we would move up to a more effective therapy. Now, a lot of us feel like the best way that we can deal with MS early on is by putting people on the most effective therapy from, from day one realizing that those more effective therapies may also come with more risk. We may have more risk for compromising your immune system with those more effective uh, therapies. So the therapies that we've been concerned about during, the, this, that, uh, you know, during this COVID pandemic 
are primarily our more effective therapies. So our B-cell therapies, our Ocrevus, Rituximab, Casimta, Truxema, uh, Mazent, Jelenia, Zaposia, uh, Ponvori, um, and Mavenclad. Abagio kind of on the border. So Abagio isn't, isn't significantly immunosuppressant, but we do have to walk, kind of keep a watch on people's immune system a little bit with that drug. So there's this balancing act between wanting to keep people on really effective therapies, but also not wanting to compromise your immune system and put you at risk for, for a bad outcome with a COVID infection. So if you're on one of these more effective therapies and we start to have some concern about your immune system, how could we potentially reduce that risk of compromising your immune system? Well, one uh, possible way would be just by reducing your dose, maybe pushing the intervals out, skipping a dose of the medication. This is all, all going to be very independent upon your individual MS, the therapy that you're on, and what we think that risk-benefit ratio is. We know that there are individuals out there that we probably could push the interval out, say, on a B-cell therapy like an Ocrevus or a Rituxan, and they're probably going to be fine for it. There are other, other individuals that we're probably not going to be able to get away with that uh, with. C is it time to maybe readdress, uh, uh, readdress whether this medicine is really going to, is benefiting you? I think a great example of this would be if you, say, had a 70-year-old gentleman with primary progressive MS who's on Ocrevus. It, at what point do you say, I'm not sure that I'm really changing the course of your MS, and am, am I putting you at higher risk for infection? So that's, you know, these are some of the discussions that occur. Or do we need to consider switching a therapy? You know, we've been big fans of the B-cell therapies, and we think they're one of the most effective classes of drugs we've had, and we've never had issues really with infections with these drugs until this COVID pandemic. And I would say even with the alpha variant of COVID, we saw no issues in our, our folks you know, on the B-cell therapies. The Delta variant was a very different animal. One of the messages we were really trying to preach, and we're still trying to preach to everyone, including the MS community, is this Delta variant is very serious. It is no joke. I think, fortunately, if you follow the Georgia case numbers, they are coming down. If you look at what Delta did in India, when it hit in May of 2021, it went sky high, killed an awful lot of people, made a lot of people sick, and then it came crashing down. Why did it come crashing down in India? Largely because it burned through its fuel. What was, who, who was the fuel in India? It was the, for the unvaccinated. Only 10% of the Indian population had the opportunity to get a vaccine. So the, uh, the Delta virus had a lot of fuel to work with in India. Fortunately, in the United States, not as much fuel, but still uh, enough. And the feeling is maybe in Georgia and other southern states, maybe we've, we've turned things around. We're not going to see the death rates drop for probably another couple of weeks because you have individuals in the ICU or maybe individuals who are just diagnosed with, uh, with the Delta variant here in the past week or so whose course is still undetermined. And sadly, some of those individuals may die, but at least the case numbers are coming down, the hospital admission rates are coming down, so I do think we've uh, hopefully turned the corner. Now we just need to, to keep our fingers crossed and pray that we don't see some other weird variant uh, pop up for us. So vaccinations, uh, so we have three options in the U.S., Pfizer, Moderna, Pfizer, Moderna and the J&J. Uh, &J. Pfizer and Moderna are messenger RNA uh, of vaccines. Basically, they're messenger RNA is a blueprint for a protein. They're wrapped in a little fatty substance. Your, those, that messenger RNA goes into your cell. Your cell sees that blueprint for the, for the COVID spike protein. It says, oh, I'm supposed to make that. Makes a little bit of COVID spike protein. The messenger your RNA is gone after that. So the vaccine itself is not sticking around. One of the reasons that I'm not excessively concerned about long-term side effects with the vaccine is because the vaccine's gone. The COVID spike protein isn't even sticking around very long. It's your memory immune cells that are sticking around. Do we see short-term side effects with the vaccines? Absolutely. Every vaccine we've ever had in the history of humanity has some risk of short-term side effects, and these, these really are no different. What we've seen is in the, real, in the real world that these vaccines appear safe for people with MS. Early on, when the National MS Society 
put out its first recommendations on COVID vaccination for people with MS, we were making an educated guess based upon what we know the, Im the immunology of MS is and what we knew about these vaccines. Now we've, we've got a lot of data out there. We've got a lot of, a lot of people with uh, multiple sclerosis who have been vaccinated. And in our experience, the MS community's response to these vaccines has really not been any different than the general public's you know, response. Do people with MS have the potential for feeling flu-like and achy? and having a headache and being fatigued after vaccination. Yeah, just just uh, like everyone else does. So the, the other hard question that, that comes up now is what about third doses or booster doses? Those things, those two words actually mean something different. Third dose is the term you would use in someone that's immunocompromised. So you could argue that certain people in the MS community depending upon the therapy that they're on, could be considered to be immunocompromised. If you give a third dose of the, the Pfizer or the Moderna, what that means is that you're getting one more quick dose after that, those first two doses. The FDA says that that third dose can be given as soon as 28 days from your second dose. Um, so we do feel like that's something that is, is probably worth looking at in some people with, with MS. And it's, it's kind of an individual discussion based upon what therapy you're on. When we say booster dose, that really refers to doing something six to eight months after your second dose. And this would be what the FDA just recommended for people over the age of 65 last Friday. No one really knew what the FDA was going to say. There, there was a thought that they might recommend booster doses for everyone, uh, all adults. And they ended up saying really only, only over 65. So the people that should be thinking about these extra doses of a vaccine would be either immunocompromised people getting a third dose or uh, people over the age of 65 getting a booster dose. There are a lot of permutations within that and a lot of, you know, well, what if, what if this happened? What if I've had COVID? Uh, what, where do I fit? So clearly, if you've had COVID, you get a natural immune response. And some people would argue that the immunity after the infection may be in some ways superior to what we get with the vaccination. When you have the actual infection, you generate more types of antibodies. You generate something called IgA antibody in addition to IgG and IgM. The vaccine don't give us that IgA antibody. So and there, these are areas where we just, we don't have studies to say this is the absolute right thing to do. You could argue that if someone's had COVID, maybe that counts as their first you know, vaccination and maybe now they're getting a booster or a third dose. What about people with the J&J &J vaccine? We talk about third doses. Well, there wasn't a second dose with J&J. &J, so what do we do with those folks? Is it okay to mix products? The at CDC says don't try to stick with the same product. We, we just, we don't have any data. So there are still a lot of questions that we're speculating and just don't have complete answers to. So just a uh, kind of a special note on the B cell therapies and vaccination. So we know that the B cell therapies have the potential to decrease antibodies. There's some research out there suggesting that if you're on Ocrevus, Rituxan, Truxema, Casempta, that the, the likelihood of you making a good antibody response after COVID infection or after vaccination, maybe 50-50, that about 50% of people on B cell therapies don't seem to make much of an antibody response. Interestingly, everybody that to date that's been studied on a B cell therapy makes a good T cell response. So they, though that is the other part of vaccination is making a, a T cell response. Is that T cell response enough to give you protection against COVID? We don't know, and I would say our month of August for some of our B cell therapy uh, patients, we, we, we had some very sick people with the Delta variant, whereas we had had very few people get sick with the Alpha variant. So I do recommend that, our, that everyone with MS get vaccinated. I like to see uh, um, some of our uh, patients get the, the um, third dose, especially my B cell patients, where the, the other question that comes in is what about the timing? So I've got an Ocrevus infusion here. When should I do my third dose or my first two doses? The National MS Society says it should be three months, uh, kind of right at the midway point, if you're thinking about a six month interval. And, and the reason they say that is that you probably get a better antibody response if you put a little time between your infusion and the vaccination. What we struggled with is I, I acknowledge that, 
but we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are getting sick and people want to be protected. Do we really want to wait three months to do that? Is maybe getting some antibody response better than getting no antibody response and waiting? And again, no easy answers there. You know, one of the things, the smartest things I've heard said you know, during this whole pandemic is there are no zero risk options. We all have decisions to make. We all have choices and they're just, we have to think about yeah, put all that together and think about what the risk-benefit ratio of each of those pathways is. So what's on the future? This will be kind of where we wrap up. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Me Too drugs, things that, uh, uh, that are on the horizon, um, BTK inhibitors, and then uh, some neural repair uh, strategies via stem cells. So Me Too drugs, what does that mean? It means you've got a drug out there that is, that is coming out that has a very similar mechanism of action to something that's already out, but maybe it offers a little something different. Maybe it's a little bit safer, maybe it's a little bit more convenient, uh, just any number of things. And so we've seen examples of that you know, recently. Casempta, one of the B-cell therapies. So once a month subcutaneous injection done at home. Is that easier than coming in for an every six month infusion? Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, it's very much, I think, an individual decision. Ponvori, the most recent kind of uh, drug in the Gelenia or S1P receptor modulator class, is one of those uh, types of Me Too drugs. So you know, these are, it's always nice to have more tools in the toolbox, but you could argue the Me Too drugs really aren't bringing a truly different mechanism of action. They're just bringing better convenience or maybe better safety. BTK inhibitors, I think this is a class of drugs you're going to hear a lot about. So these are drugs that work through B-cell pathways, but they do it very, very differently. All of our B-cell therapies right now are monoclonal antibodies that work on either something called the CD20 receptor, or at least in the, the neuromyelitis optical world, there's also one that works on the CD19 receptor. Very effective drugs, great way of, of shutting MS down. But now we're going to have another way of looking at through these BTK inhibitors. And so BTK plays a role in B-cell receptors and how B-cells interact with your immune system. Uh, these are going to be something we'll see a lot of, I think, in MS, other, other autoimmune conditions, and also in some B-cell malignancies, certain types of, of lymphomas uh, as well. And there's a lot of companies working on this. was a quote from a, 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 a scientific article, and they were saying you've got all these companies that are in just a race right now, and they're all betting a lot of time and, and treasure that these are going to be the next wave, and it's going to be a question of kind of who, who hits the finish line first with one of these therapies. And then lastly, something that's near and dear to our heart, it's a mesenchymal stem cell trial. So... One of the things that we hear in the MS community commonly, and we take it very much to heart, is I want a cure for multiple sclerosis. And when people say a cure, a lot of times what they mean is reverse my disability. I want to walk, I want to run the same way I did 10 years ago, 20 years ago. How do we reverse disability in MS? And there are a lot of different pathways. A lot of money and effort has been spent in the past 15 years by the National MS Society, the NIH on neural repair. A lot of that initial research, research was at the laboratory level. These were mice studies and test tube studies and things that were interesting, but sometimes they didn't really catch our attention in the clinical world. Well, now you're seeing the fruits of all that behind the scenes labor pay off. So Shepherd Center is working with a company called MSTEM. Uh, so we were one of two sites uh, in the United States selected uh, to do a mesenchymal stem cell uh, infusion trial. Uh, so the hope is that this would be something that versus disability. This is very early research. We infer, infused the first human ever uh, to receive this speci a specific mesenchymal stem cell about three weeks ago. She, side effect wise, she flew through it like a champ, no side effects whatsoever. Too early to say. She says she feels better, D too early to say, if, you know, this is gonna be something that we would watch over, you know, a year or two to really see. We're slated to infuse the second human uh, in uh, probably next week. So there are two Two sites in the U.S., four sites in Europe that are doing these studies. Again, very early. Uh, so what's happening right now from a safety standpoint is when one human being receives the, the stem cells, every other site in the world is frozen. No one can do anything until we watch that individual for three weeks. 
well, this the first uh, human uh, past the three week mark, so now we can do person number two, and they'll keep this rolling along. After we receive, I uh, have infused a certain number of people, and we have a good sense that nothing bad is going to happen in those first three weeks, then it will really speed up, and we'll start going quite a bit faster with that. So stay tuned. Hopefully, we've got great things to come, and I, I really do believe that we will see a day when we can reverse disability, not only in MS, but in spinal cord injury, brain injury, you know, stroke so many conditions where the ultimate you know, answer is repairing nerve fibers, rebuilding myelin. So, and with that, Stuart, I'm turning it over to you. And with that, that's fabulous. See, this is what everybody's missing is a real talk. All right, a real talk, right, everybody? You all agree? This is what's needed. The MS community needs to hear you do this more and more and more. So we greatly appreciate what you did as you hear and as we go forward. Okay, thank you. By the way, there's a subject you didn't touch on. Yes, sir. Stem cells. Stem cells, that was that, the mesenchymal stem cells. Oh, you were that, gonna give us yes. a stem cell update. What about from the uh, Shepherd Center? So that was it. The, okay, the, I'm sorry, yeah. I missed something there. Oh, uh, he stepped out. <laughs> I had yes, to step no, out. No, we bragged on it. Nature was calling, I had to get out of the room. <laughs> Come on. Stem cell toilet, stem okay, cell toilet. Okay, that's right, that's you right, thank right, you. You made the right choice. All right, yeah, I, did, I definitely made a right choice, all right? <laughs> all right, sorry, I'll have to listen to it on uh, afterwards, okay. All right, first question from the audience here. Actually, first question that was asked from those who were registering online. And what new is happening with stem cell treatments for multiple sclerosis? Is stem cell safe and when will it be allowed? So I always, when we, we do the bigger stem cell discussion, I always step back and say, so when we say stem cells, there really are two different types of stem cells that, can, that we can discuss. So, so the study that we're doing at Shepherd Center is mesenchymal stem cells. These are cells, this is a cell line that was approved by the NIH. Uh, these started life as embryonic stem cells and then they were let, they evolved uh, sort of let them mature to a certain point to become mesenchymal stem cells. You don't want to use stem cells that are, when you're talking about repair strategies, that are too primitive. The problem with embryonic stem cells is they are a genie in a bottle. When you let that genie out of the bottle by putting it in your body, it can do good things or it can do bad things. And the problem is you cannot put the genie back in the bottle. So embryonic stem cells have the potential to come a lot of things. Well, what if they became a cell that you didn't want them to become? So an example is uh, Shepherd Center years ago was doing a, a trial in spinal cord injury where stem, these uh, embryonic stem cells were injected into the spinal cord of people who were paraplegic. They couldn't get any worse. Well, some of those mesenchymal stem cells were becoming things they shouldn't become, like stomach lining tissue. That was clearly bad, so that, was a, that study stopped. The other type of stem cell is, would be autologous stem cell transplant. So this is a bone marrow transplant. This is more, I wouldn't think of this much as a repair strategy as much as, as I would a really, really effective disease modifying therapy. So you're, you're giving yourself a new immune system. I'm gonna take immature cells from your bone marrow. Those cells can become anything in the, in the immune system. I'm gonna wipe out your existing immune system with chemotherapy. I'm gonna clean your hard drive. And then I'm gonna give you those immature cells back and let you make a fresh immune system, an immune system that doesn't have the memory to attack your brain and spinal cord. Um, multiple centers, Northwestern uh, Center in Ottawa, Canada, centers uh, Queen Square in London have shown that this is a very effective therapy. The key with, with autologous stem cell transplantation is you've got to pick the right individual to do it in. And the right individual is going to be under the age of 50, has relapsing remitting MS, and they've got hot disease. They have a head full of active inflammation. The challenge that we have here in the U.S. is, is there really is nowhere doing that. Those, those studies right now, they're all, they're all kind of wrapped up. More will start up. So people want this procedure done, but there's nowhere in the U.S. to do it. So they're going to Mexico, to Clinical Ruiz. They're going to Moscow, to Russian centers. The problem with the, over the sea, overseas centers is they're very indiscriminate. If you've got the money and you have a pulse, they will do it, and that's not a good thing. So think about it's an aggressive procedure. It's chemotherapy that, that's strong enough to wipe out your immune system. You've had this done in Mexico or Russia. You're going to stay there for a month, and then they're going to let you come home. If you have a complication from that procedure, you're probably not going to go back to Mexico or Russia to get that dealt with. So it's, it's something that people really have to think about, and, and we, try to, we do a lot of counseling. We've had num numerous patients do it, um, and, but again, we, we've, we've 
really counsel them a lot before they, they do that. Thank you for that answer. Isn't it even more dangerous, though, that they come back to the states, they have something happen to them, but their local doctors have no idea how to communicate with anybody to find out actually what was done to them. Absolutely. And so we've encouraged people, if they're going to do that overseas, is to make contact with a hematologist who's familiar with bone marrow transplantation here in your local community and make sure that doctor knows what you're doing, that they're willing to follow up. There, there are bad things that, that can happen, infections and just a, a number of different complications. So you want to make sure you've got a, a, a home team to look over your shoulder. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, bouncing around, uh, virtually just asked with your one-to-one -one CBD spray study, which is, what is your opinion to use the spray or the gummy? So I th either one is fine. So I would prefer either spray or gummy over smoked or vaporized. The, so when you think about what you're trying to do for spasms and spasticity, you'd like to have something that sticks around for a while. And so if you inhale cannabinoids, they get into the central nervous system quickly, but they also leave quickly. So if you're miserable and you need a quick response, maybe doing an inhaled cannabinoid is, is fine. But if you're, if you're thinking of more long-term management, I would do either a, a sublingual spray or, or a gummy form. I think either one is, is fine. Thank you. I was corrected. It's not, it's not, uh, yeah, they want to know the sublingual specifically with the spray, not the, uh, not the gummy that I referred. Yeah. So the sublingual, if you, I mean, if you hold the spray or the oil under your tongue, it, it does, it's probably somewhere in between a, a gummy and a, and a, a smoked form. Cause it is, you've got a lot of veins right under your tongue. So it can get absorbed pretty pretty quickly. But uh, still, I, I probably prefer that for kind of the length of the duration of the uh, symptom control over versus a smoked form. Okay, so from the local audience right here, similar to what we were just asking, cannabinoids are CBD gummies. Are they effective? So CBD by itself. So you, anyone can buy CBD products over the counter. If you've been to any store, you've seen them there. All of the CBD products you see sold legally are hemp-based CBD. By law, they cannot have more than 0.3% THC. Some have zero THC. I don't think it's a big difference between zero and 0.3. If you're trying to sleep better, if you've got a little bit of anxiety, um, I think a little CBD uh, at bedtime is wonderful. They don't do a lot for the MS symptoms that we're trying to go after. They don't do as much for spasticity and spasms, uh, central neuropathic pain or bladder symptoms as THC containing products do. So I think if you really want to go after MS symptoms, you probably need more THC than what you're going to get in the, the over-the-counter products. Great. Thank you for that. What about the CBD topicals like roll-ons for uh, cramps, uh, any creams and whatnot? That would be the exception to what I just said. So whereas I said the CBD oil by mouth, I'm not blown away with what that does uh, for spasms. The, the topicals occasionally do help out some. So at why the difference? I have no idea. But I think some of the CBD topicals are, are awesome. Uh, if I have back spasms, I, I use a CBD topical. I prefer the, the pump forms where you can actually see how much you're getting. Um, we sell at Shepherd Center a, a roll-on form. And the thing that I, and I'm trying to get our pharmacy to, to carry more of a pump form, the thing I don't care about with the roll-on form, and, and I don't know if others have had this, I can't tell how much is going on. I feel the cold metal ball and it's like well it's cold it, it might be wet it might not be i would rather see actually how much I'm, I'm getting so i've heard that people have had bad trips from cannabis especially after doing like a vaccination <laughs> i've heard that <laughs> really so what is it about that and what can uh what can be told or what should people know about that i mean what kind of havoc is already going on in their bodies to do something. Cannabinoids are funny things. There can be a very fine line between having a therapeutic effect and having a side effect. So cannabinoids act in differently in different areas of the brain and they act differently at different concentrations. So, the, so for instance, if you have THC working in the prefrontal cortex of your brain, it tends to have an anti-anxiety effect, a calming effect. If the THC works in the amygdala, a more prim primitive part of your brain, you tend to get paranoid and even potentially delusional. There's a lot that we're still learning. It's been even suggested that the mood that a person is in when they use a cannabinoid may have some bearing on, on what sort of response 
that they get with it. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons I, I tend to like the oral forms of, of cannabinoids a little bit better or spray form where you can control what you're getting. You know, if you're taking a big puff of something, whether it's you know, the plant material or a vaporizing, you really don't know. Uh, it's harder to control the dosing that, that you're getting with those. Okay, sorry that I had to come over here, but the question is so long that I have to read it because <laughs> there's just no way that I can do, I can hear it all. All right, person says, hello, I've tried different dosages of baclofen. Tizanidine was added to baclofen and still had no change in spasticity. I also take Nabilone, Sesamet for pain and no results on that front either. What would you advise? So, you know, if, if you've... If you've gone as high as you can go with baclofen and maybe you're starting to now run into side effects, same thing with the tizanidine. If you've maximized the dose and you've not gotten benefit, sesamet is another one of the, the synthetic THC. So it's like Marinol. Um, again, it's gonna, you're, you're going to go up on the dose until you're either sleepy or you have some symptom control. If you've gone through all of those things and you're still not having symptom control, the old school dantrolene or, or dantrium, the drug that's used for spinal cord injury, may be worth worth a, a try and something like that, we definitely would want to get a rehab doctor, a physical medicine rehab doctor involved to see what else can, is there out there. Is there focal spasticity? Are there muscles that are so tight that we could potentially think about Botox injections to really go after those muscles. The, the Botox you really have to think about because you're going to temporarily paralyze that muscle. If it's a muscle you're using in your daily activities, we probably don't want to want to paralyze that muscle. But but that's the potential. And then intrathecal baclofen would be the uh, the other thought. I would because th this person's tried out the synthetic THC. I am a believer in something called the entourage effect with cannabinoids, and that's the thought that if you just isolate one cannabinoid whether it's CBD or THC, that it's going to be less effective than if you use the whole armamentarium of what's in that plant naturally. So you, there are tons of other cannabinoids other than just CBD and THC, and maybe the additive effect of those things would give that person a better benefit than just the synthetic THC by itself. The other problem that you run into with sesame and Marinol, the synthetic THCs, is they're, they're pure THC uh, or synthetic form of it. There's no CBD you're actually more likely to have the psychological effects with that than you would be with something that, that contains some CBD. Oh, tell us about the dab. The dabs, yeah, don't be, anybody aware of what dabs are? Dabs, dabs, we got over there. Yeah, be careful with dabs. So dabs, uh, if, you, if there were teenagers here, they would know what they are. So dab looks like a little drop of brown wax. It is extremely concentrated. Can, uh, cannabinoids. It's, so it's, it's, it would be the waxy version of hash, basically. So it's very high THC, high CBD. And what people do is they take that little button of wax and they put it in something that can warm it up and they, they inhale it. The problem is, unless you have an incredibly high tolerance for cannabinoids, you take a big puff of that thing and you're probably not going to be functioning for a while. Uh, you're either going to be so sleepy or you're going to be seeing things uh, for, for a while. Yeah, so be careful if someone offers you a dab. Yeah, yeah. Sounds personal. The, yeah. <laughs> I, I had back spasms after playing with my grandson and my uh, a family member who shall be unnamed uh, said, well, why don't you try this? And, and I did. And I, did, I, I will never yeah, do that again. Our, when our dog would bark, I could see the bark. I could see her bark come, and yellow flowers went back. I was like, and I knew it was not right. I was like, oh, no. I, I told her later, I said, let's not offer me that again. That was not, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and as, as, long as, he, as long as doctor confessed to that, I'll have to tell you that the person that did a booster and had delusions after smoking a little cannabis, well, that was me. <laughs> all right. And that was a crazy night. All right. Really, really crazy. I had things coming at me in the dark. My eyes were wide open, but my brain was telling me it was getting dark, and I had these monsters coming after me. So it was crazy, yes. You gotta watch yourself on these things. That's the bottom line. So while we're on the subject of cannabinoid side effects, the other thing that we are seeing in the United States is something called hyperemesis syndrome. So, and it's paradoxical, because normally you think of cannabinoids as treating nausea, lessening your nausea. If you get too much, though, you can have 
bad nausea and it, it, it will it will send you to the emergency room uh, these are people who have protracted nausea and vomiting that goes on for hours and hours and hours the problem is it doesn't respond to Phenergan or Zofran the way that nausea normally does so what they basically have to do is just sedate these people and hydrate them until it wears off so it's it's an it's you either in someone who's a chronic uh, ca cannabis user and they've just d done too much or they do something like a dab and they get wham this huge hit uh, all at once so yeah be cautious thank you thank you everybody in the room i'll be back around to get your cards for your questions in a minute it's just that we got some long questions here and i just want to be able to read them all right all right doctor the next one if somebody's on okravis receive if someone on okravis received both vaccines moderna of moderna prior to beginning the dmt what does their immune response look like so if you got your vaccination, and this is any vaccination, before you started Ocrevus, and ideally you'd like to do those six weeks before starting Ocrevus, those those immune responses are perfectly fine. Ocrevus is not affecting your past memory immune function. The question is, does it affect your ability to form new immune memories? So your your response to the prior vaccination should be fine. Do we need to think about a, a third dose for that individual? I, I would. Um, one of the questions that, that comes up, too, with Moderna specifically, is the way the Moderna booster or, or it was booster dose study was done is 100 micro micrograms for dose one of Moderna, 100 micrograms dose two, and then when they did the booster, they did 50. That was in people with normal immune systems. So if someone is potentially immunocompromised in the MS world, should we do the 50 micrograms? Should we do the 100 micrograms? I would probably do the 100 micrograms for the, for the third dose uh, in that setting. Thank you for that. All right, next long one. On or I am on Ocrevus for four years, age 64, thinking about switching to Mavenclad, hoping to be done with therapy then. Any thought? So Mavenclad has, is an interesting drug. Cladribine, it's, you know, it's a drug that well, we studied about 12 years ago. Um, so it's an oral medication, super, super convenient. Uh, you could argue that in some ways it's a little similar to al alemtuzumab or lemtrada in that what it's doing is it's kind of knocking down your B cells and T cells and then letting them come back in hopefully a non-angry state. Um, I think in the right individual, Mavenclad can, can be... a a good drug. Um, we do use some of it. I think the other question when, when we start getting into our 60s and 70s is this concept of immune senescence. Humans do reach a point where their immune systems kind of mellow out. And so if you have an autoimmune condition, that's probably a good thing. Maybe your immune system is no longer angry enough to attack your brain and spinal cord. We know it happens in all humans, the age at which it happens is the question. So we normally start thinking about it. You know, could this person have reached that mellowed immune system state at age 60, 65? So if this person's 64, it, it would be, you know, a, a question. Could that person potentially even maybe think about going off of therapy? When we have people go off of therapy, we always leave them on vitamin D. So we tell folks, you're really not on no therapy. You, you're just on a smaller therapy. Vitamin D is a legitimate disease modifying therapy in MS. It's just certainly not a Tysabri or Ocrevus or that type of drug. So, so that's, that would be an interesting discussion for that person to have with their neurologist. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to read the last one that's currently online. Then I'll get back to these and the audience and we'll be wrapped up in 15 minutes, I hope. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, how does getting the monoclonal antibodies COVID plus therapy affect the patient's MS therapies like Lemtrada and et cetera. Yeah, so you've got these monoclonal antibodies that we use to treat COVID. Regeneron uh, would be the one that, that's used here in the United States. So these are monoclonal antibodies that t really are very effective at, at toning down COVID symptoms. Just because you're on one monoclonal antibody, Ocrevus, Tysabri, Lemtrada, that doesn't mean you can't be on another monoclonal antibody. These, these monoclonal antibodies are very specifically targeted at, at something. So they're, they really shouldn't interact with one another. So, so if a person on any MS therapy needed Regeneron, there shouldn't be any trouble with them getting that, and it shouldn't, the Regeneron shouldn't have any negative effects on their MS or their MS therapies. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And insofar as infections, what forms of herpes 
Did you mention that may have triggered MS? Yeah, so that's, we always catch people's attention when we say herpes. It's human herpes virus 6. That's roseola in kids. So it's a common uh, herpes virus. Chickenpox is a herpes virus. So the thing that's kind of weird with herpes viruses is they, once we get one of those, doesn't matter if it's one of these, roseola, chickenpox, you know, uh, herpes simplex, cold sores, general herpes, you carry that virus for the rest of your life. And we and they, they live in our near our central nervous system. Um, so the human herpes virus 6, roseola, we don't think it's that you have an ongoing infection. It's just that, that that particular herpes virus may have fooled your immune system if you're genetically susceptible. A lot of viruses on their surface look like myelin basic protein. And so your immune system, if you have MS, said, you know what? That virus kind of, I know that's a foreign invader. I'm going to kill that virus whenever I see it. But that virus kind of looks like that myelin basic protein up in my brain. Maybe that myelin basic protein is a virus also. So over years, it starts cross-reacting. It starts treating your myelin as if it were that virus and attacking it. Thank you. Next, what sparked your interest to do MS studies when you came into the medical profession? So I started my neurology career in general neurology in Spokane, Washington, and uh, pretty quickly, about 50% of my general neurology practice was multiple sclerosis, a big prevalence of MS. I realized that as a neurologist that I was part of the equation for managing MS, but that there's more. There's physical therapy, occupational therapy, research, case management, uh, you know, psychology, and there was no comprehensive MS center between Seattle and Minneapolis. So you had a huge chunk of the country that really did not have comprehensive MS care. So we uh, really sort of jumped in both feet. Didn't I had not done MS specialization in, in uh, training, so I sort of, as an adult neurologist, farmed myself out to MS centers around the country for one week, two week blocks to send, kind of see how people were doing things. And I think in some ways that was better because I was able to pick kind of what I thought were the best models from, from each system. Randy Shapiro, uh, was a big, big influence on me. I spent a lot of time with Randy and was very kind in helping us set up our center in Spokane, Washington. Randy Shapiro was a big influence on me, too, when I first was diagnosed. That's cool. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Now we have a link. Yeah. <laughs> Aside from MS, right? All right. Um, Dr. Thrower, concerning vaccination, how soon should a person get the first dose before Ocrevus? So ideally, you'd like to have your vaccine series, whatever you're doing, COVID, jingles, whatever, finished six weeks before you start Ocrevus. Okay, thank you. Next, person asked, what is Truxima or Truxima or whatever? Truxima, T-R-U-X-I-M-A, is a biosimilar to Ocrevus. I'm sorry, to Rituxan, excuse me. So Rituxan is, and Truxima and Ocrevus are all anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. They all do the same thing. Uh, they're antibodies that, that work on B cells. So Rituxan is off patent now. So you have companies making biosimilars. So the Truxima is just sort of a, it's really, we're not supposed to say generic, it's a bio similar. It's, it's a molecule that looks like the rituximab molecule. Thank you. Three questions remain. First, what... Oh, I was just told in my ear that that's wrong because there's two more there, too. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next, uh, what causes bladder infection? So the most common cause of bladder infection in MS is a, someone who's not emptying their bladder. So they have a neurogenic bladder. Bladder can be small, overactive, low volume in MS, or it can be large, underactive, and it empties like you're pouring water in a glass, and it's overflowing, but it never empties. That urine sitting there all the time is a great place for bacteria to grow. All right. From my ear, virtually, what is the cause for cognitive decline? So and what do you do for it? Yeah, so cognitive dysfunction is, is seen in 65% of people with MS. It's due to the demyelination and axonal loss. And depending upon where that's at, it's going to sort of determine what your cognition, what your cognitive issues look like. Two most common things are going to be word finding difficulty and slowed processing speed. Realize that, that everything that you feel as cognitive dysfunction in MS may not really be directly from your MS. Your fatigue is going to mess with your attention and concentration and give you a hard time 
storing new information. You can't remember something five minutes later if you didn't store it in the first place. Mood changes, depression is going to mess with, uh, with attention and concentration. A lot of the medications that we use, if a medication is sedating, like baclofen and tizanidine, it's probably going to affect your cognition. If you have poor sleep, it's going to affect your cognition. So we want to look at the big picture to try to make sure we're not just putting everything in the MS basket. Okay, next, the person is on Obagio. I think this is what I'm going to say for my ear. Had both vaccinations and want to know if it's okay. And, and oh, they had their vaccinations in March, and they want to know when they can get their booster. Yeah, Baggio is kind of one of those gray areas. So I don't think of it as being highly immunosuppressant. Uh, you know, if the person is age 65, you know, for sure, it, it, uh, it, I would certainly think about a booster at age, I mean, at the six to eight month mark. If you wanted to say, well, maybe a Baggio is a little bit immunosuppressant, maybe we should think about a third dose. The letter that we sent out to all of our patients about boosters and third doses, we wrote to be purposefully vague because there are all these gray areas. A lot of it's going to depend upon what the person themselves wants to do. If they say, you know, I'd, I'd like to err on the side of being more protected. I'm on a Baggio. Could it be a little immunosuppressant? I want to go ahead and do a third dose. I, I think that's perfectly fine. All right. Can a change in cognition cause a flare up? No. So, so changes in cognition, I would think, you know, you know, these are something that we look at over the long run. If someone has an acute change in cognition, they were at one level yesterday and today they wake up and they're at a totally different level. That could be an exacerbation. It's a strange, it would be strange for an exacerbation to cause only cognitive decline. I would be much more concerned that there's something else going on, an infection, a, a medication side effects, something acute that's causing that. Okay, so that leads into two more questions. First, how do you determine if you're really having a flare or an exacerbation? So that is not an exact science. We wish there was a little warning indicator on your forehead that would light up when you're having a relapse, but so sometimes it is not easy. The strict definition of a relapse is new or worse than neurological symptom that comes on and lasts for at least 24 hours and we don't have a better explanation. Sorting that out from just daily symptom fluctuation, I'm fatigued, I'm stressed, I've got an upper respiratory infection, is, again, I, it's not an exact science uh, to do that. When in doubt, call your healthcare provider team. That's what we're here for. Okay, thank you. Can a UTI cause an exacerbation? UTIs cause pseudo exacerbations, false exacerbations. It's not that your symptoms are false. Your symptoms are very real. Your decline in functioning is very real. We call it pseudo because it, it's provoked by something. That urinary tract infection caused that worsening of your symptoms. The treatment is not throwing steroids at it. The treatment is treating your urinary tract infection and hopefully preventing others in the future. Okay, that leads to another question. What do you do when your doctor doesn't believe you're in a pseudo exacerbation? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, uh, um, get a hammer. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, again, it's seriously, it's, we're all humans. And, you know, you're, the challenge in modern medicine is sometimes you're not dealing directly with the, the physician. You're dealing, like at Shepherd Center, you're dealing with a call center. You're dealing with a, you know, a my chart system. I think when we're dealing with call centers, the, you're, you're, I'm getting your story probably through two other sets of, of humans who've interpreted that story. And some, sometimes my interpretation of it is basically whatever that nurse's interpretation of it. So there, I wish I had an easy answer for that one. That, that's, that, that's tough. Okay, thank you. Next one, how do I find an activity team or sports-related group in my area that doesn't exclude people without military or government background? A, a what sort of team? I don't know. Maybe this isn't the real question for something to do with multiple sclerosis. How do I find an activity, team, or sports-related group in my area that doesn't exclude people without military or government background? Hmm. I wouldn't think you'd have any trouble finding that sort of thing. I mean, one of the resources I send a lot of our, our individuals with MS2 is, a, uh, and I'm open to, if anyone else has thoughts, I send people to a website called meetup.com. Meetup is any sort of hobby you can think of, and you put in your geographic area, and you're just saying, it's not a dating site. It's just, you know, I'm a, I knit. I want to play lacrosse. I want to go stand up paddle boarding and I'm looking for a group of like-minded individuals and it gets very, very specific. You can say, 
people with MS interested in paddle boarding, and you'll find people in your area. There's no charge for it. It's free of charge. I think if you want to set up the group yourself, there's maybe like a $25 administrative fee. Thank you. So the person has multiple sclerosis and lives in a military town, and that's what they were looking for. Uh, so, so, they're, so they're getting is a clickish military. Clickish, yeah. 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 That's a, yeah. Something to do with Alabama, they said. Yeah. What's yeah, I don't know that I have a great answer for. Jeff for has a great answer for it. Can we hear Jeff, Jeff's yes, answer? Yes, sir. Work with the spouses. Spouses. Work with the spouses. There you go. I there like that because they're not Perfect. military. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Thoreau, we're done with the questions. So thank you very, very much for doing all this. And we're finished in the time frame that you wanted. How about a real handshake? There you go. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll speak to you in a few. All right, perfect. Firstly, I want to thank everybody. Yes, hang up, my virtual person. All right. So um, we are finished with tonight's program. This was a great event. And I'm glad that you were all here. I'm glad that for all that stayed through the very end. It was a long program, but it was a very, very needed program. For anybody leaving, you're giving somebody else the chance to win a raffle. All right. But first, I want to say goodbye to everybody that was here with us virtually, OK? It was very nice to have you online tonight. I hope that you can join our future programs. Please visit the MS Views and News website. That's www.ms, as in Sam, V as in Victor, N as in Nancy, .org. OK, look in the center column of our website. You'll see all the programs that are happening for the next 30 days, as they always continue. All right. And, um, and then you'll be able to you know, get online and register for our programs. And you'll be able to see also from our website what we're doing in hybrid programs as we go forward. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day and a good night. Ciao.